Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our final installment for Unit 4, Cells. Today, what we're going to be talking about, as I'm sure you can see from the uh, very nice picture down here of someone sneezing, today we're talking about germ theory. So germ theory, what we're going to be talking about is how infections spread, how people get sick, and the steps that we took to eventually figure out how all of this works. So we're going to be talking about a couple of scientists today, a couple of theories, and that should just about round it out for today. And also how to prevent these from happening to you. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get this thing started. So if you think back, the very first microorganism observations, do you remember which scientist did that? I think we talked about it in the first lesson. I'll give you a little bit, a little bit of time to think. All right, time's up. Remember, in 1673 to 1723, there was a man by the name of Anton von Leeuwenhoek. So Anton von Leeuwenhoek described live microorganisms that he observed in teeth scrapings, rainwater, and peppercorn infusions. So what he did was he went ahead, looked at it under his custom microscope, which looks very similar to what we have over here, and what he saw were these tiny, tiny moving things. These tiny moving organisms. He actually thought they were monsters at one point, but I mean, that was a long time ago. So what he saw were the first living microorganisms, or the first cells. So back in the day, there was a theory known as spontaneous generation. So the hypothesis was that living organisms can arise from non-living matter. So about 100 years ago, it was believed that toads, snakes, and mice could be born from moist soil, flies from manure, and maggots from decay. So what they noticed was that, so there seemed to be, you know, piles of manure laying around in farm areas, and sure enough, over time, flies would just appear there. So they were thinking, wait a minute, no. maybe, just maybe, those flies are coming from the manure. Same thing with maggots. So they saw decaying organisms, decaying flesh, you know, things like that, and they found maggots there. So they were thinking, well, that has to be where maggots come from. So a man by the name, sorry, I itched, a man by the name of Francisco Reddy performed an experiment. What he did was he predicted that keeping flies away from the rotting meat would prevent maggots from forming. So what he did was he did a little experiment here. He had a couple of jars. He put rotting meat in each one. And what he ended up doing was he covered one jar completely. He put a kind of like mesh wire film on top of one of the jars, and the other one he left open completely. So it looked kind of like this. So what he had was, with the flask here on the right, he left it wide open. Sure enough, the flies got in. As you can see, we've got maggots. Now, in the second one, where he had the wire mesh up on top, he noticed that fewer flies got through, so there were fewer maggots on the meat. Meanwhile, the one where he went ahead and stopped it completely, over here on the left, no flies could get in, so no maggots actually appeared. So what that all means is, if spontaneous generation was correct, that means that all three flasks and all three pieces of meat would have maggots on them, in which case they don't. So, for example, if spontaneous generation existed, I'd be able to, like, poof, penguin. Where'd he come from? I have no idea. Who cares? Let's move on. So, the theory of biogenesis. There's this dude down here in the right-hand corner that we're going to talk about later, but for right now, we'll get to that in a sec. So, the theory of biogenesis. So, bio meaning life, genesis, creation. So, biogenesis, creation of life, from life. So this was the alternative hypothesis, that living organisms arise from pre-existing life. Remember, think back to the cell theory. Life from life, cells come from pre-existing cells. So a man by the name of Louis Pasteur had an S-shaped flask that kept microbes out but let air in. So it looked kind of like this. So here's the thing about Pasteur. Pasteur was an avid winemaker. And also, in the past, 
he lost kids to many of the diseases that were going around at the time, many of the bacteria, many of the microbes. So he wanted to find a way to help this out and stop people from getting sick. But where his main contributes came from were in the wine industry. He noticed that all the country's wine was slowly going bitter and, you know, souring over time, which isn't good. So he wanted to figure out what was happening that caused this to occur. So when he went ahead and took a look at the wine itself under a microscope, what he found was that there was bacteria causing the wine to go ahead and spoil. So what he did was he invented a heat treatment. Basically, that means he boiled the wine or heated it up, and sure enough, it killed off all the bacteria inside of it. So by going ahead, so here we have our flask, before he went ahead and heated it up and put the S in it. He poured the wine in there, the wine had bacteria. He went ahead, heated it up, and as he did, the air escaped, and no microbes could get in. So anything that was in here was being killed off. And sure enough, at the end, he found that this saved the wine from spoiling. Now, this process was known as pasteurization. And this is still a process that we use today to go ahead and heat treat liquid to kill off the bacteria so we don't get sick. So Pasteur, in my opinion, was kind of a boss. A B-A-W-S boss. But anyway, that's enough about Pasteur for now. We'll get back to him later and some of the other contributions he had. So theory of biogenesis, life comes from life. Let's move on. So the golden age of microbiology. In 1857 to 1914, beginning with Pasteur's work, discoveries included the relationship between microbes and disease, immunity, and antimicrobial drugs. So this is where most of the modern medicine started to occur from. So if you want to go ahead, please go ahead and click the link, uh, uh, link below, watch the video clip, take notes on what you see, and I'll be here when you get back. I promise. I'm not going anywhere, I'm a recording. So, when you're finished with that, I will see you on the next slide. Enjoy, it's actually a really cool movie. So, Infectious Disease, by the way, what'd you think of the movie? Pretty cool, right? Who would have guessed that back then doctors didn't wash their hands? Seems like common knowledge now, right? But anyway, let's talk about what we have here. Infectious Diseases. So, where does disease come from? In the past, what they used to believe was disease was brought on by curses, evil spirits, or bad-smelling vapors. So if you had a curse on you, you know, if you had, a, let's say, smallpox, it was because you had a curse, or there was an evil spirit within you, or something like that. Or you inhaled some bad-smelling vapor. In the present, though, what we know is it can be inherited. So it can be brought down from generation to generation. You can inherit it from someone in your family. For example, hemophilia. Hemophilia is the body's inability to produce the clotting factor, which stops bleeding. So if you go ahead and get cut, it's going to take a lot more to stop the bleeding. They can come from the environment, so like cigarette smoke and other pathogens that float around in the ecosystem we live in, which can cause cancer and other sicknesses. It can also be biotic agents, so bacteria, fungi, protists. Now, I'm not going to include viruses in that. We did it just for simplicity's sake, but remember, viruses aren't alive. But they can cause a wide variety of different diseases. Now, a pathogen is what we call a disease-causing uh, agent, or a sick maker. So a pathogen is anything that can make you sick. So that would include environmental factors, biotic agents, and inheritance. Now, a man by the name of Robert Koch led the forefront in figuring out what caused these diseases. So Robert Koch described the steps of infectious disease in 1876 after the work of many other scientists when he used them to prove that Bacillus anthracis, a specific type of bacteria, was the cause of anthrax poisoning. So as you can see down here, noted by the uh, blue arrow, this was his process that he went through. Now we'll talk about the process in depth on the next page. So Koch's postulates, also known as the theory of infectious disease. The first thing he did 
was he isolated the organism from every case. So he noticed that an organism died. He went ahead, took a look at it, and found there was a specific type of bacteria there. So he isolated that. The second step was he went ahead and regrew the bacteria in a culture. So he grew the bacteria to create basically a huge colony of whatever that bacteria was. The third step is he injected, he reproduced the disease by injecting the organism into a suitable recipient. So like you saw on the last page with the rats, what he did was he injected his culture of Bacillus anthracis into the rat. And sure enough, you would go ahead, monitor what happened, in this case the rat died, he re-isolated the organism, and tried again. So like we said before, he isolated the uh, bacteria from the dead rat, found out it was Bacillus anthracis, or the anthrax bacteria. He grew it in a culture, so he went ahead, grew more of them, isolated it, and injected the new culture into another rat. Sure enough, he waited, the rat died, and he noticed when he took a blood sample what killed it, or what was present, that was the anthrax bacteria. So he re-isolated that, regrew it, and the cycle continues. Now I know you might be thinking, oh, those poor rats. But think about it. By sacrificing these rats, what he found out was how bacteria causes specific diseases. And once we know that, we know how to fight it. We know how to prevent it. We know how to stop it. So, Koch's postulates led the forefront for how diseases infect other people and how we can slowly start to combat that. So during the past century, Koch's postulates have been used many times. Koch himself discovered the cause of tuberculosis. So we're going to talk about a couple of other scientists here and what they discovered the cause of. There he is, Louis Pasteur. Boom, why did I put my sunglasses on? Because like I said before, Louis Pasteur is a boss. So Pasteur found the cause of rabies, anthrax, and chicken cholera. Like a boss. All right, <clears throat> sorry. Anyway, Edward Jenner found the cause of smallpox. So what he did here was he found a type of cowpox and noticed that people infected with cowpox were not infected with smallpox. So if they had cowpox, the smallpox didn't want anything to do with them. So he actually created one of the first vaccines. And also, Alan Steer. Alan Steer found the cause of Lyme's disease, which in this area of Virginia, ticks are everywhere. So this is actually a huge turning point. So isolating things, finding out what causes the disease, played a huge part in how we could combat these sicknesses. So how diseases spread? The first type is person to person. That's the most basic type there is. So for example, coughing, sneezing, physical touch, wash your hands. For example, the common cold, mumps and measles are all spread from person to person. Prevention, it's very basic. Cover your mouth when you cough. If you have to go ahead and sneeze, do the Batman sneeze. Go ahead. <laughs> like you bring the cape around you. Wash your hands. Come on. They've been preaching this since elementary school. If you go to the bathroom, wash your hands. If you cough into your hands, wash them. Please wash your hands. I used to know a guy back, you know, when uh, cold and flu season was around. He actually would not shake anybody's hand. Like, everybody, hey, man, how you doing? He'd be like, cold and flu season. That's it. He'd just trying to walk away. So, person to person. Cover your mouth when you cough. Wash your hands. Basic common knowledge. STDs. So, sexually transmitted diseases. Some of the most dangerous pathogens are spread person to person by sexual contact. These infect millions and kill thousands each year in the USA alone. For example, some types of bacteria. Bacteria can cause syphilis, which can be fatal if not treated. Gonorrhea and chlamydia, which go ahead and damage your uh, reproductive tract and inhibit your ability to reproduce. Viruses that can be spread include hepatitis B and C, one of which is incurable, genital herpes, and AIDS, which can be extremely fatal. 
So STDs, I'm sure you'll learn more about this in health class, but we're just going to skim over them here. Person to person, rec to safe. So how diseases spread? The second way is it can spread through contaminated food and water. Prevention, proper cooking of your food, hand washing of food workers, and sanitation of water. So you want to make sure your food is cooked thoroughly. Inside of meat, there are a wide variety of sickness, uh, sicknesses that can spread, like food poisoning, things like that. But also there are a huge amount of parasites that can actually lay eggs inside the meat. And if not heated up to the proper temperature, can go ahead and, you know, live inside you. The more you know. So hand washing of food workers, um, you're in high school. Chances are before you leave high school, you'll be having a job. If you're working with food of any type, make sure you're washing your hands. Anything on your hands can get transferred to that food, meaning that you could get a lot of people sick if you don't maintain proper hand washing procedure. And also your sanitation of water. So if you're going ahead, you're in the middle of the uh, woods somewhere, and you see this body of water, you're like, yes, I'm saved. So you go ahead, stick your head in the water, and you start drinking. That's not good. Because there are bacteria and viruses and a wide variety of uh, other microorganisms inside that water that can make you sick. Dysentery. It's not cool. You don't believe me? Go play the Oregon Trail. It's for free now. Boot it up. I guarantee you at least one person in your caravan will die of dysentery. You basically die by... Uh, Let's say it's dehydration. Let's go with that. So make sure you sanitize your water. Boil it before you drink it. The third way it can spread is through infected animals or vectors. So a vector is an animal that carries a disease-causing organism from person to person. For example, ticks carry Lyme's disease. Mosquitoes carry malaria and West Nile. Prevention. Limit your exposure, avoid the tall grass, and if you do have to go in tall grass, make sure you wear protective, tight clothing. Also, check yourself for ticks, especially in this area. Also, spray insecticides. So, uh, I can't believe I'm doing this, but, all right, nerd warning, here you go, here it comes. So, another way of prevention, think Pokemon. That's right, I elite snow, you know what that is. But Pokemon, think about it. You walk in the tall grass, you catch Pokemon, right? Spray insecticides. Use Repel. Keep that stuff away from you. Well, all right, there we go. That was my nerd quota for this month. So, anyway, let's keep going. So, ways to fight infectious disease. Treatment, antibiotics. So, antibiotics kill the bacteria without harming the cells of humans or animals. So antibiotics focus mainly on the bacteria. They find it, they kill it. Now the first discovered antibiotic was penicillin, or penicillium, which interferes with the synthesis of bacterial cell walls. So think of it like this. Think of the bacteria as a house. What penicillin does is it goes ahead and removes all the nails, all the fasteners, all the screws from the house. What's going to happen? Basically, the house is going to fall in on itself. Penicillin works the same way. It removes the cell wall, and slowly, basically, the bacterial cell just kind of oozes out and dies. So that brings us to the end of yet another video PowerPoint here for Unit 4, Cells. So today, we talked about germ theory. We talked about how disease and bacteria can spread and make you sick. We also talked about of how they used to believe organisms came to be through spontaneous generation and we now know that it works through biogenesis life from life you can't just pull a chinchilla out of the woodwork chinchilla also we talked about some of the scientists that helped pave the way for finding out how disease spreads and how we can stop it so that is just about going to do it for today so until next time i will see you in the next video, you all keep it classy.